Some of the things I will say this evening I know will worry liberals greatly. Some of the things I will say will annoy conservatives even more greatly. So that suggests that either I am totally bipolar, or Confucius is, or that it might be helpful for you to try to bracket those kinds of labels and try hard to listen to what I'm going to say on its own terms about the Confucian persuasion. Not to try to convince you to become Confucians, although there are worse things to be, but I hope one thing to make clear is that one can give good credence to a great many things that are Confucian without abandoning one's being a Catholic or a Buddhist or a Muslim or anything else. I think you will find as you dip into the Confucian texts that much of what they say is compatible with a great deal of what goes on in other world religions, largely because of the classical tradition on which I focus uh, has no metaphysics. So Confucius doesn't say anything that conflicts with the metaphysics or theology of Christianity, or Judaism, or Islam, or Hinduism, or Buddhism for that matter. It is a very serious attempt to sacralize uh, the, sac the secular. And that, of course, could be compatible with virtually every spiritual tradition the world knows. So as I'm talking, and of course part of my, why I have enjoyed the Confucian so much, and why they have taught me so much, and what I hope you will get from Professor Jung's class, from Professor Johnson's classes, is not simply the window into another culture that they provide for you, but by teaching you well, have that mirror, a window become a mirror of your own culture. So you will learn to see what has made you who and what you are, what your hopes and dreams and fears are in a different way. And you will come to see that history didn't have to be the way it has turned out to be. It isn't just this happened, Rome fell, it's just been a bunch of dominoes ever since. Or going back to the Greeks. With that I begin. There are some ominous signs in the United States and around the world today the spread of human rights has not only continued to not continued to advance, there's been a retreat. A great many Americans, for example, unfortunately, despise Barack Obama's health care plan because it suggests that everyone has a right to health care. At the same time, too few Americans are complaining about the manifold violations of privacy and legal detention rights justified in the Patriot Act daily violations of the rights of U.S. citizens in the name of anti-terrorist security. Worse, at the Guantanamo dungeon complex, more than half of the 171 prisoners, and here I quote from a State Department memo, have been fully cleared for release by a joint review conducted by the military, CIA, FBI, and the Department of Homeland Security, unquote yet they remain in shackles. Now, keeping people locked up who we admit there is no reason to keep locked up is the very definition of arbitrary detention, to my mind, a terrible violation of what many claim to be a very, very basic civil right. There's much more. The opprobrious Supreme Court Citizens United decision is surely a case of providing a political right to the rich it is denied to the poor. Immigration rights worldwide, once fairly well agreed upon, are now being withdrawn, as are many of the rights accorded European peoples following the rise of the welfare state after World War II. <clears throat> Draconian measures supposedly necessary to keep the euro from collapsing. And of course, as yet, there is no shortage of tin horn dictators who run roughshod over virtually all of the rights of the people under their boot in the global village we have supposedly become. The plight of human rights movements is made much more complicated by the fact that many conceptual issues pertaining to human rights have not been settled to everyone's satisfaction or perhaps even to the satisfaction of the majority. 
which is at least in some cases the cause of the refusals and the retreats from their establishment, in my view. A number of scholars have said these philosophical questions should be bracketed for the foreseeable future because of the widespread acceptance politically of the idea of universal human rights in general. Detailed definitions we may ignore for now, they would say, the immediate lack being to, uh, need being to implement rights regimes worldwide. But that argument is unfortunately becoming less convincing with each passing day, as my ex above examples indicate, and which I could multiply a hundredfold. I thus don't believe the conceptual issues will go away i.e. things like issues of religious freedom, and what that means is simply one of the more common ones hitting us here in the U.S. today. Some of the conceptual issues, quickly, are what exactly are rights grounded in? What is the underlying presupposition or foundation for the idea of human rights? John Locke and the founding fathers of the U.S. said God but obviously that won't do in today's world, nor will the view that they are grounded in human nature because that's a concept no less equally contested in the world today. If there are rights, which of them are fundamental? Can they be ordered? Are any inviolate? Why or according to whom? How adjudicate competing or conflicting rights claims? How balance entitlements and responsibilities with respect to rights? These and many similar questions, it should be noted, are not purely or even largely legal questions, but they are moral and political in nature. Thus, while Jeremy Bentham was much too dismissive when he claimed that rights other than legal rights were, quote, nonsense upon stilts, unquote, there is yet much more work to do philosophically and politically on fundamental issues surrounding the concept of human rights. Because it has proven difficult to secure agreement on answers to these and related questions, both in philosophy, politics, and foreign affairs, meditating on them from a Confucian perspective is made much more difficult, especially when the rights, concept of rights is altogether absent in the writings of the Confucians. So that is what I'm saying is that it's hard to offer a Confucian meditation on the concept of rights because I would say, whose concept of rights are you going to be meditating on? But perhaps a more fruitful comparative approach would be to place concepts of human rights in the larger concepts of justice. For all concepts of rights are inextricably embedded in concepts of justice and thereby perhaps we may be able to think more clearly for ourselves and for each other about the scope, limits, and purpose of human rights. Our views of human rights may be more or less clear, but I believe we all have basic intuitions about justice. At least everyone who has ever said, that's not fair, must have some intuitions about what justice might be. The early Confucians did not have a word for justice any more than they had one for rights until a misleading neologism was coined in the mid-19th century to translate the English term as with rights. But the writings of the early Confucians do reflect a clear concern for balance, for harmony, just deserts, and what is fitting and proper. So we may justifiably attribute to them, I believe, a fairly strong sense of fairness, and thus have some warrant for suggesting how they might critique our conceptions of human rights as those rights are linked to concepts of justice and fairness. Now the major claim I would want to advance to you this evening for, and I hope we will take it up in detail during the discussion to follow, I can state in several related ways. First, Within the economic system of corporate capitalism that now dominates the industrial democracies and most of the rest of the world, the more that one kind of justice, namely procedural justice, is championed and defended morally, and thus politically, 
the less will justice of another kind, distributive justice, be ever be achieved politically and thus morally. Put in the language of rights, an insistence on the first generation civil and political rights of individuals dependent on procedural justice obstructs the demand of social and economic human rights called second generation rights that are dependent on distributive justice. Or to put in much more straightforward everyday terms, individual freedom is increasingly being purchased at the expense of social justice for an increasing number of the world's peoples in ostensible democracies no less than in any other nation state. By procedural justice, I use the common reading as insisting on the priority of the right over the good. Fair procedures, clearly spelled out and contractually agreed upon, figuratively when not literally, not outcomes determine what is just. Distributive justice I will take as synonymous with social justice, as already suggested, i.e. having to do with the distribution of goods. And for present purposes, we may gloss the differences between purely material primary goods, such as food, medicine, clothing, and shelter, and other non-material goods which are equally primary, such as dignity, health, and self-respect. Turning directly now to distributive social justice, greed, of course, is one of the major reasons the gap between the haves, the have-mores, and the have-nots is growing in the US and worldwide, even while here get gathered together here this evening to discuss the topic. But the major problems are conceptually deeper, I believe. After all, while the rich continue to get richer, they remain far fewer in number than the shrinking middle classes and the ever more numerous poor. Statistics released last December show that fully 20% of American children are growing up in family whose income falls below the poverty level, even though over three quarters of those families have at least one working parent. The first year that their recession appeared to be lessening, 2010, 93.5% of all income gains were maintained by that 1%, with 6.5% going to the remaining 99% of the American people. Every month in 2011 had a significant increase in the number of homeless people, with an ever more significant increase in the number of families among them. At the same time, our bankers and brokers are giving themselves multi-million dollar bonuses for bringing our country to the brink of financial collapse and consistently sp spreading unemployment. And the top 1% as a group now own more than a third of the nation's privately held wealth. Now it seems to me, no matter whether we are Democrats, Republicans, or independents, this state of affairs seems patently unjust. The recent Occupy Wall Street movement in New York's Zuccotti Park spread far beyond the confines thereof. But we should ask why these very welcome protests against such social and economic inequities were so long in coming. Why did the midterm elections of 2010 send so many politicians to Congress who were determined to sustain the distributive, distributive injustices. Why is the so-called nanny state of Barack Obama that is being condemned by them, Fox News and many members of the punditocracy, especially when that nanny state is endeavoring, however feebly, to ease at least a few of the many economic and social injustices rampant in our country? To answer these questions from a Confucian perspective, we must begin with the fact that a close reading of the early canonical texts suggest a fairly different concept of what it is to be a human being than the concept which is foundational for modern Western moral philosophy and attendant politics. 
And consequently, Confucians will have a different view of what it means to be a moral person and thus to act justly. Confucians certainly see each human being as unique, but they would not describe persons as individuals in the sense of being able to describe, analyze, and evaluate them psychologically, politically, morally, or metaphysically in isolation from their fellow human beings. For Confucius, individuals cannot be the locus of human worth, nor the focus for ascertaining moral responsibility. It is not merely the term individual that a Confucian would object to, but rather the closely related term employed to modify it, autonomous. Individualism is a foundational presupposition, not assumption, of modern Western moral and political philosophy always implies autonomous. Freedom is something individuals have, which grounds the possibility of autonomy. And here the Confucians would argue, I think, that the concept of free autonomous individuals is not only a fiction, it has become a highly pernicious one because it provides a moral and a political grounding for greed, untrammeled greed, in an economic system which can no longer be seen to be a cure for most of the world's ills because it is a central part of the disease. The famous follower of Confucius Mencius put this point quite succinctly, quote, if you want to become a good and exemplary person, you cannot seek wealth. If you want to seek wealth, you cannot become a good and exemplary person. Or from Confucius himself, good people's job is to help the needy, never to make the rich richer. For the Confucian, we are all fully interrelated, uniquely specifiable persons, but always in relation to other human beings and thus we are always encumbered. Freedom is not a state of being for Confucius. It cannot be because there is no word and therefore no concept of freedom in the early Confucian texts. But if it's to be anything at all, it would be an achievement term. Somehow we come to delight in meeting our responsibilities. But I cannot be free. I must always be encumbered for a Confucian because I am always relating with and to other human beings. So it is probably better to say, even though it distorts the English a bit, that I am less a human being than a constant human becoming. As my relations change, I change. But before I say more about the early Confucian concept of what it is to be a human being or becoming and what the good society might be like, I must say a bit more about the ideology of individualism that undergirds the corporate capitalism that dominates the contemporary world and has been a major force in American politics and foreign policy since de Tocqueville described that ideology almost two centuries ago in his Democracy in America. The concept of the autonomous individual underlies virtually all modern moral and political philosophy and has, to my mind, at least two very mischievous effects. First, it enables libertarians, growing in numbers significantly in the US, Europe, and in Asia, to claim a moral high ground centered in the concept of human freedom as the basis of procedural political justice, with a consequent rejection of the concept of distributive justice as immoral and or totalitarian in its implications. And so long as non-libertarians, i.e. conservatives, liberals, and socialists alike, ground their objections to libertarianism in the concept of the autonomous individual, a Confucian would understand that the challenges will always be met successfully by the libertarian thus continuing to provide a moral basis for a laissez-faire free market capitalist global economy that is exacerbating the gross inequalities of human well-being both within 
and between nation states. I will return to, the, especially in democracies, I'll return to this very strong claim toward the end of my remarks. The second reason I believe the concept of the autonomous individual is pernicious is its deep pervasiveness in the consciousness of Western intellectuals to a depth that makes it almost impossible to see any alternative to individualism, free autonomous individualism, except a more or less faceless collectivism. That is to say, by challenging the concept of the free autonomous individual on behalf of Confucius, it may seem that I am at least implicitly arguing for some form of totalitarianism or other, Stalinist or fascist. Now, if these were indeed our only options, then of course we should champion individualism at all costs. But these are not the only conceptual alternatives and are seen as such largely because of the effectiveness of the propaganda championing an ideology grounded in the concept of the free, rational, and usually self-interested autonomous individual, which leads in turn to another dichotomy between selfishness and altruism in the moral sphere. These dichotomies have been much too sharply drawn, in my opinion, making it very difficult for us to entertain other ways of envisioning what it might be to be a human being in concomitant view of what might be the best way for us to interact with our fellows. Why has this propaganda been so effective, especially in the US? There are a number of reasons for that, many of which I cannot go into tonight. We get a hint from a paper that the philosopher David Gauthier, published in 1977, did not receive much attention. It was called The Social Contract as Ideology. He claimed that in Western thought, quote, social relationships were seen as construed basically in terms of contracts, real or implied between two or more agents, self-interested, appropriative, and rational, i.e., that is, individual agents, unquote. He also claimed relatedly that in this ideology, the essential characteristics and actions of human being are best described, analyzed, and evaluated on the basis of seeing human beings as most fundamentally free, autonomous, and rational individual selves. Now, Gauthier himself championed this model. He wasn't criticizing it. But from this ideological perspective, social relations will be seen as justifiable, clearly, or as just, only as they are agreed to by individuals, self-interested, appropriative, and rational. Thus, within this ideology, Gauthier continues, society, people living together, is not the natural state of and for human beings. It is an artifice constructed on the basis of the self-interest of those who contract to build it. Gauthier's article did not gather much attention when it was published, and it is easy to see why, for it is highly subversive of almost all of modern Western moral and political philosophy. He claims that the social contract theory that began with Hobbes and has run through all modern Western political theory up to and including John Rawls and Gauthier himself is of course a fiction, yet has become an ideology of which he says that it has become a basic, and I quote him again, a basic part of the deep structure of our self-consciousness. By self-consciousness, I understand that capacity of human beings to conceive themselves in relation to other humans, to human structures and institutions, and to the non-human or natural environment, and to act in the light of those conceived relationships." Unquote. Now, if Gauthier is right, and I believe he is, there is an implication that has not been teased out by many people, namely, that it is extraordinarily difficult not to view human beings, including ourselves, of course, as most basically free, autonomous, and rational, and usually self-interested, 
contracting with other individuals similarly constituted for our own and mutual benefit. It thus becomes extraordinarily difficult for us to conceive or imagine standing in any other relation to our fellow human beings. At an even deeper level, Gauthier's analysis implies that so long as that ideology can hold us, it will never be possible to be objective or impartial in evaluating conceptions of justice or of human rights or of human nature of almost anything else for that matter that might be at odds with the ideology of the social contract entered into by free, rational, and usually self-interested autonomous individuals. Think, for example, of something that just came up last week about climate change. How could such a large number of people, including many with college degrees, including a number in our House of Representatives and Senate and in state houses, deny what scientists in all of the relevant scientific field are in virtually unanimity about. We are in fairly immediate danger of making this planet irreversibly unfit for human life. How can that be denied? Naomi Klein has recently given one answer that resonates well with Gauthier's early analysis of the ideology of contract theory and individualism. When a belief system becomes deeply sedimented, you simply can't entertain anything else. She says, I quote, there is simply no way to square a belief system that vilifies collective action and venerates total market freedom with a problem that demands collective action on an unprecedented scale and a dramatic reining in of the market forces that created and are deepening the crisis." Unquote. That's why there is still denial. There is also an aura of the self-fulfilling prophecy about this ideology. The more we see ourselves as free and rational autonomous individuals contracting with others for our own self-interest, the more likely we are to become and act as such. As books ranging from David Reisman's The Lonely Crowd to Robert Bella's Habits of the Heart to Robert Putnam's Bowling Alone have been saying about American society for a half a century now. By acting on the basis of the view of human beings as free, rational, and self-interested autonomous individuals and accepting the ideology of social contract theory, human beings will ever more conceive themselves as free, rational, autonomous individuals who negotiate with others for their self-interest. But if we are neither autonomous individuals nor akin to herd animals as a faceless Stalinism or fascism would have it, what else might we be? What are the alternatives? Well, now let me return to the Confucians a little bit. By emphasizing our sociality, they simultaneously emphasize our relationality, both of which are instilled in us from birth as members of families. Perhaps the most original insight of Confucius was to see that who we are is overwhelmingly a function of who we are with and when. For him, an abstract individual, I am not and never have been. Rather have I from day one been a son. I've been a grandson, a sibling, a nephew, and a cousin. Later I became husband, father, grandfather, teacher, student, colleague, neighbor, friend, more. In all of these roles I am defined by the others with whom I interact. Highly specific personages related to me in one or more ways. They are not abstract autonomous individuals any more than I am. I live rather than play these roles. And when all of them have been specified and all their interrelationships made manifest, then I have been thoroughly individuated, but with nothing left over with which to piece together an autonomous individual self. 
Being thus the aggregate sum of the roles I live, it must follow that as my roles change, so do I. Marriage made me a different person as to becoming a father and then grandfather. Divorce or becoming a widower would change me yet again. Former students become young friends. Young friends become old friends, all of which have a significant effect on who I am and how I am defined. All the more so is this true when old and cherished friends and relatives die making me yet again different. Where is an autonomous individual in any of this? As an aside, we can note that with the moral epistemology of Confucianism grounded in the family, the good will always have priority over the right in thinking about justice and the nature of our social and political institutions. This is not to say that Confucians would have no use for purely procedural forms of justice, but that those forms could not stand in the way of achieving distributive justice, especially within the family, clan, or community, or culture. We may note here, too, for ourselves no less than for the early Confucians, that within these groupings, the language of rights is almost never heard. Love, respect, and affection must govern our interactions with family, kin, neighbors, friends, not contract specifying rights. From this perspective, entering into contracts with other is almost invariably the worst way to establish or maintain human relationships. I can hear cases at law as well as anybody, Confucius once remarked. The task is to do away with cases at law as much as we can, unquote. Now, although this early Confucian view of the human being is very different from the abstract autonomous individual, rational, free, and self-interested, locus of moral and political analysis current in Western philosophy, I hope it is not seen as remote from ourselves as ordinary people, for the Confucian view seems to me a very straightforward account of our actual lives. In order to be a friend, or a neighbor, or a lover, for example, I must have a friend, a neighbor, or a lover. To the extent I have defined my life as a teacher significantly for the past 40 years, you are essential to my definition, not incidental to it. They are never accidental or contingent to my goal of following the path of being fully human and possible. Indeed, it is the others with whom I interact that confer personhood and identity on me, and they do so continuously. To the extent I live the role of teacher, students are necessary to my life. It must also be noted in this regard that while I believe Confucianism must be seen as fundamentally religious in order to be understood, in its tradition, there are no monks, nuns, anchorites, anchoresses, or hermits to be found in the tradition. The way is made in the walking of it, but one never walks alone. My colleague Herbert Fingeret, in his masterful book, Confucius, the Secular of Sacred, put it very, very beautifully and succinctly. For Confucius, unless there are at least two human beings, there are no human beings. Our first and always most fundamental role, as noted earlier, is as children. Shao, which my collaborator Roger Ames and I have translated as family reverence rather than filial piety, is one of the highest excellences of integrated thought and feelings to be nurtured in Confucianism. We owe unswerving loyalty to our parents and our manifold responsibilities to them do not cease when they die. From our initial role as sons and daughters, and as siblings, playmates, and pupils, we mature to become parents ourselves, and become as well spouses, lovers, neighbors, workmates, colleagues, friends. All of these are reciprocal relationships, best described, I believe, as holding between benefactors and beneficiaries, not between superiors and inferiors. 
which have been all too common in Western interpretations of classical Confucianism. The roles are thus clearly hierarchical, but not elitist. And each of us moves from benefactor to beneficiary and back again, depending on the others with whom we are interacting and when we are interacting with them and under what conditions. When young, I was largely beneficiary of my parents. When they became old and infirm, I became benefactor. And the same holds with my children. I am benefactor of my friend when she needs my help beneficiary when I need hers. Taken together, the manifold roles we live define us as unique persons, undergoing changes throughout our lives. And the ways we instantiate these relations is the means whereby we achieve dignity, satisfaction, and meaning in life. And a sense, perhaps, of achieved freedom when an increasing number of our relational interactions become spontaneous. But despite this, we are always encumbered, never free or autonomous in the Western sense. The ideal Confucian society, grounded in the family, is thus a natural state of and for humankind not an artificial construct rationally agreed upon for mutual self-interest. Confucian persons are first family and community oriented and then extend themselves to still others, relating to and with them as benefactors and beneficiaries in an intergenerational context and deriving increasingly deep satisfaction from so doing. Confucius himself was absolutely clear on this point when a disciple asked him what he would most like to do, he said, quote, I want to bring peace and contentment to the aged, share relations of trust and respect with friends, love and protect the young, unquote. For all of these reasons, I believe Confucianism is best described as a role ethics. It is not a theory as such, but role ethics is nevertheless unique, having no well, close Western counterpart to the best of my knowledge. In the first place, it does not employ or seek universal principles, because what we should do depends on who we are doing it with and when. Confucianism is highly particularistic, in that we are always told to do not what is right, but what is appropriate in a given situation. And what might well be appropriate for me to do with my grandmother may differ significantly from what I should do if it was my younger brother in that particular situation, or it was my teacher. Although Confucian particularism precludes universal moral principles, we may nevertheless make a few generalizations from the canon that are no less important today than they were 2,000 years ago. When interacting with the elderly, be reverent while affectionate, caring, and obedient without becoming servile. When dealing with peers, don't treat them as you would dislike being treated yourself. With the young, be nurturing, careful, loving, exemplary. Of course we did not learn these generalizations as moral principles when we were young, but it is on the basis of many and very loving interactions with my grandmother that I learned long ago to develop an approximate sense of how to interact appropriately with other grandmothers. Confucius is telling us that if we learn to get the little things right on a day in and day out basis, most of the so-called big things will take care of themselves. And in addition to grandmothers and other elders, the little things involve our close interactions with peers and with those younger than ourselves and in this way begin to bring home to each of us our common humanity. For all of us have and will go through all of these phases of life. I can only begin to actualize my moral and spiritual potential when I have learned from my interactions with my own grandmother that although each grandmother is surely unique, they share qualities, live roles, and interact with others such that in one sense, when you've learned to fully appreciate your own grandmothers, you've come a long way toward appreciating fully all grandmothers. 
despite vast differences in skin color, ethnicity, religious background, or other characteristics. And if you believe your grandmother deserves decent health care, it becomes much easier to see why all grandmothers deserve decent health care. Being thus altogether bound to and with others, it must follow that the more I contribute to their flourishing, the more I too flourish. Conversely, the more my behaviors diminish others by being racist, sexist, nationalistic, homophobic, the more I diminish myself thereby as well. Now, in saying that I can only flourish as I contribute to the flourishing of others, and I'm diminished when I diminish others, I hope it is clear that I am not just proffering here a Confucian view of selfish or altruistic behavior. For this would imply that I have a free, autonomous self to surrender. But that, of course, begs the question against the Confucians whose clears, views clearly show the supposed dichotomy between selfishness and altruism as a Western conceit, as is the idea of the social contract and the Manichaean split on which both are based, the individual versus the collective, if not the free market, then Hitler or Stalin. In many respects, positing autonomous individuals as the defining characteristic of the species served well in the past, even though it has always been an ontological fiction, because it functioned as a healthy conceptual counter to all patterns of authoritarian thinking, from nationalism to racism to the divine right of kings, and much else that are also ontological fictions. We must therefore remain grateful to John Locke and Thomas Jefferson for extending the idea of basic rights being applicable to all persons. But Confucians are role bearers, not rights bearers. And it is here we begin to appreciate the critique of procedural justice grounded in the concept of human rights. Locke's vision is now, from a Confucian perspective, much less a help than a hindrance in furthering social justice and consequently peace between with within nations. Much good has come from acceptance of this vision in improving the lives of millions of people, but the dark side of it is coming increasingly to the fore as the growing maldistribution of wealth both within and between nations becomes starker and transnational corporations become ever less accountable to any political or legal institutions in their search for ever greater profits. This dark side of all ethics and political philosophy grounded in the concept of the abstract autonomous individual and the concomitant view of universal human rights is that when individual freedom is weighed more heavily than social justice, the political, legal, and moral institutions and instruments employed in defining and enforcing that freedom guarantees that social justice will not be achieved. To see more clearly how and why this is so, let us return directly to human rights and consider the U.S. Bill of Rights, enshrining many of Locke's views as amended by Jefferson and focusing on freedom of speech, of association, of worship, and to freely own and freely dispose of property legally acquired. Clearly, these civil and political rights, now referred to as first-generation rights, are linked to the individualistic view of persons. If I am essentially free and rational, self-interested and autonomous, then certainly no one else, especially a government, should interfere with my speaking my mind, worshiping as I choose, associating with whomever I wish as I pursue the projects I have chosen freely for myself. These civil and political rights, however, from a Confucian perspective, purely passive that they are focused solely on freedom from, which can be seen from the fact that from a Confucian perspective, I can fully respect all of your civil and political rights simply by ignoring you. You have a right to speak, not to make me listen. To appreciate the significance of this passivity or negative liberty, as Isaiah Perlin put it, we must look to the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 
which in addition to the civil and political, also lists the number of social, economic, and cultural rights, such as the right to a job, education, health care, decent housing, and much more. These are Articles 20 through, through 27 of the UN Declaration. These second generates are active rather than passive, concerned as much with freedom to as with freedom from. They are active in the sense that there are certain things I must do if you are to secure the benefits of these rights. At the least, pay more taxes. But by simply listing all rights seriatim, the Universal Declaration implies that they are all compatible with each other. But to the extent they are grounded in the concept of individualism, they aren't compatible with each other. For if I acknowledge your rights claim to housing, health care, a job, and so on, then I must actively help you obtain them so that you may pursue your own projects. But then I am no longer free to self-interestedly pursue my own projects. And consequently, I am strongly inclined to deny that you have legitimate social, economic, and cultural rights at all that I too could secure the material benefits accompanying second generation rights is no counter to this argument if I believe I can secure those material benefits on my own or in some freely chosen rational contractual form in conjunction with a few others. Nor can it be replied that I may freely choose to assist you on my own for this would be an act of charity, not an acknowledgement of your rights to these goods. Consequently, if I am well off, I will be strongly disinclined to see second generation rights as truly rights, for I would surely be less free and not as well off if they were. Rather will I want to exercise my freedom to spend money to elect officials who will see them as hopes or aspirations, as the U.S. Senate, for example, has done for four decades now as it consistently refuses to ratify the UN International Covenant on Social, Economic, and Cultural Rights. Or I'll want to have officials who refer to those rights as, quote, letters to Santa Claus, which is a statement from former US ambassador to the UN, Jean Kirkpatrick, referred to them disparagingly. This argument can be put another way. The odds are fairly high that much that needs to be done to achieve social justice will not be in the individual self-interests of the haves and the have-mores have in this world. It is therefore not surprising that the wealthy in the United States and elsewhere deploy the considerable political and economic means at their disposal to ensure that a meaningful redistribution of primary goods will not be enacted into law. But to oppose poverty alleviation measures seems on the face of it cold, callous, cruel. Thus a moral justification will be needed to celebrate, or at least tolerate, the rich and the powerful in order to justify maintenance of the status quo. John Kenneth Galbraith put this point well when he said, quote, the modern conservative is engaged in one of the oldest exercises in moral philosophy, that is, the search for a superior moral justification for selfishness, unquote. In the past, this fundamental conflict between issues of individual freedom and social justice could be papered over by championing freedom today and claiming social justice for the moral. The ethos of capitalism allowed the haves to avert their eyes from the have-nots by insisting on economic growth as the cure for poverty. As the pie got larger, everyone would get a larger share. Social justice could be achieved without any sacrifice of individual freedom. But it is a fantasy to believe, as capital apologists, capitalist apologists would have it, that poverty can continue to be overcome by increasing productivity. As remarked earlier, there are virtually no dissenting scientific voices 
to the claim that the earth can no longer endure the exploitation and mutilation it has suffered for the past two centuries and it continues apace today. As one economist, sociologist put it in response to policy proposals to end the present economic recession in the US, quote, attempting to grow our way out of unemployment is ecological suicide, unquote. Now, if these perspectives are correct, they imply that distributive justice can only be achieved by a number of measures of wealth redistribution. And the wealthy, believe me, know that very well. In other words, if poverty is to be eliminated in the name of achieving distributive social justice, and if the economic pie cannot be increased much longer at the Earth's expense, then extant and future pies must be apportioned differently. And that cannot be but at the expense of the currently well-to-do which seems to require a diminution of personal freedom. The more money I must give to aid the plight of the less fortunate, and the more regulations I must endure in my search for increasing my wealth, the less free I really will be. We might thus anticipate that not a few among the rich and super rich and their political servants there are now over 1,200 billionaires and 8 million multimillionaires, and over 50% of the Senate are made up of multimillionaires themselves, will be unwilling to pay the cost and will defend their unwillingness morally by making an appeal to individual freedom and autonomy as trumping matters of legislation aimed at the alleviation of poverty and the regulations of corporations. If we believe as individuals that we do not need our brother's help in getting on with our own lives, why should we believe we are his keepers? If we can take care of ourselves, why can't they? It is in this way that the very wealthy and unfortunately many others justify their behavior morally. They are not going to say they are greedy, selfish, avaricious, unfeeling, or have any of the other more despicable qualities many of them at least at first glance may appear to have. Rather, they are going to say they are acting on principle, especially the principle of the inherent freedom of individuals to pursue their own project as they wish, so long as they respect the similar freedom of all other individuals to do the same. These people are thus only insisting on the right to be left alone and to dispose of their resources as they see fit. These are the most basic of social contracts, they will say. But that is by no means the extent of the libertarian's moral argument. Most such people will also claim that in the long run, the overwhelming majority of people will be better off if individual and corporate usual freedom is protected in all areas at all times for all persons not imprisoned letting the free market reign for the maximally fair distribution of goods. To achieve this noble end, no distinctly visible hands need apply. Put another way, very few Wall Street bankers or brokers and others among the wealthy think of themselves or want to be thought of as moral monsters, I suspect. Hence, they advance moral, political, and economic arguments based on Anne, everywhere from Ayn Rand to Adam Smith, Robert Nozick, Isaiah Berlin, Milton Friedman, Ludwig van Mises, Friedrich Hayek, and a host of other important thinkers to get themselves off the ethical hook. That a number of these thinkers are economists of no moment here. The economy drives the politics and the cultures of the societies comprising the global village today, and thus its norms and values as well. And of course, there is nowhere that one can find more full-blown defenses of freedom as an unalloyed good than in the writings of Immanuel Kant and John Stuart Mill. Thus, on the libertarian account, my major obligation to you is simply to leave you alone. And that is all I'll ever ask of you in return. I am not responsible for being born white or male or an American or whatever any more than I am responsible for your being born a Congolese Cambodian, rich, poor, tall, or short. 
I am now responsible for myself and for those with whom I have freely contract mutual benefits. Thus, I'll find my own job, I'll obtain my own health insurance, develop my own pension plan, purchase a home when I can afford it, see to the education of my children, thank you. You do the same. Knowing that everyone pursues their own self-interest, I'll also participate actively in the electrical process, electoral process, where the competition can be no less fierce than in the free market where it should flourish. On all of these scores, again, you should do the same. If misfortune on any of these scores should befall me, I'll suffer them in silence and now not ask for a handout from you or anyone else. I receive no inheritance from my parents, but I certainly do not want to be told I cannot leave the wealth I honestly accumulate over my lifetime to my children. And please note that for every one of these affirmations I have just made, I can formulate an action-guiding maxim that I can will to become a universal law. Rest assured that every libertarian worth his or her salt has taken Kant very seriously. Moreover, as suggested above, the great bulk of mainstream economic thinking and a lot of political thinking for almost two centuries undergirds this view, namely that the whole world will eventually be more prosperous for a great many people if the free market reigns and those involved in those markets enjoy maximal freedom to invest and produce as they think best. Those few people who don't prosper will have only themselves to blame. That is what the concept of individual responsibility is all about. On this account, individual and corporate freedom and self-interest will bring about the greatest utility, ultimately, for the greatest number of people in the society which of course shows that I've also taken the utilitarianism of Bentham and Mill very seriously. If we object that we all have some obligation to eliminate poverty, the libertarian will demur, saying he bears no responsibility for the plight of the poor and consequently has no moral or political responsibility to relieve it. I may give generously to charities, he will say, but it is my business and no one else's to decide to whom and how much. If we further object that the history of capitalism over the course of the past 150 years does not warrant any optimism about significantly reducing the number of people living absolutely wretched lives, he'll reply that the fault is with nanny states that have continuously interfered with free market exchanges. Remove the constraints and the best possible measure of social justice will be achieved without sacrificing freedom. We may continue to raise objections to the libertarian account, but we shouldn't count on any of them having much purchase, for the libertarians' views are not rationally unreasonable. They are well grounded in the concept of freedom and unencumbered autonomous and attendant first-generation rights. And thus they constitute a viable moral belief system with a number of straightforward implications for political no less than moral theory. The most important of which, to my mind, is that so long as you accept the presupposition that human beings are basically free, individual, and autonomous selves, and accept as well the ideology of social contract theory, you will never denude the captains of industry, the bankers, and the otherwise wealthy of their moral cloaks, nor will you rein in their dominance in the political arena. Once again, from a Confucian perspective, we are purchasing freedom at the expense of social justice. Role living Confucians, on the other hand, can indeed condemn the libertarian and demand that governments reallocate material goods and services to achieve a just society. Further, even though Confucians would be skeptical of the concept of human rights as long as they were seen to inherit autonomous individuals, we may nevertheless see that from their perspective, there would be no gap between first and second generation rights as found in the UN Declaration. If my primary responsibility to others is to help them flourish, then of course I will give great weight to social, economic, and cultural rights. But from the role living perspective, the goods that accrue to first attend first generation civil and political rights flow just as easily. 
if my aim is to help you flourish, why would I want to restrict your freedom of speech and not listen to you? Or not let you associate with others of your own choosing? Or forbid you to embrace the faith that sustains you? That is to say, when grounded in role-bearing persons, moving from second to first generation rights is perfectly straightforward. But the converse does not hold. To rights-bearing individuals, civil and political rights loom large. But there is a chasm between them and second generation rights, which no one has yet successfully bridged. And there is little reason to believe that moral political philosophers will bridge them in the future, so long as they believe that human beings are all self-interested capitalists at hearts, which is at the heart, of course, of groups like the Tea Party. And on this basis, I commend the text of Confucius to your thoughtful consideration. I have spoken for a long time. Where in Cain's question from Genesis 4.9 is answered clearly and affirmatively. I am my brother's keeper, my sister's too. Thanks very much.